What are you going to do when you're both crazy stressed and you're disconnected? How do you give feedback sexually in a way that your partner can digest? There were no tools for any of that. And so those were all the things that we were facing and didn't know how to, you know, figure out together. So we spent three years figuring out that we had nothing figured out. I looked her in the eyes and I knew it was it was over, it was gone. I bury this thing in my soul. I get about a year and a half into this and at 27, I just hit a complete brick wall. It starts physically, adrenal exhaustion, and I'm working crazy hours, you know, and it was such a hard uh, message from the universe that change needed to happen. And so while I was still ignoring the emotional and spiritual impact of the divorce, I couldn't ignore how much physically I was just ailing. And I began to really meditate on not just what it looks like to forgive Megan for the divorce, but to get to a point where the best version of myself includes rooting for her. So I was on my own spiritual path, trying to connect my soul to the divine. In those moments of stillness, just by myself in my room, I would think about my future partner, you know, from this sort of balanced state. Picture my heart with a tether to the heart of the individual that I would eventually meet. And that was my person. I had no idea that it was going to end up being my ex-husband. <laughs> uh, that was a funny little wrench there. Ooh, plot twist. Uh, once we got back together, we, we started sharing the details of when we were apart. It was like, holy shit, that yeah. happened to you too? We both hit adrenal, hormonal rock bottoms, literally clawing our way out of this hell hole, really nursing ourselves back to health from scratch. Part of that was also the emotional and, and spiritual side. Welcome back to the Medicine Podcast and the Great Unlearned Podcast. <laughs> my name is Mimi and I have my love, my king, my partner in this life and all others with me here. What is going on, everybody? This is Chase. We are so blessed and so fired up to be here in the home of Cal Callahan. Welcome to the Medicine Podcast, my friend. And we're so glad to be on the Great Unlearn and finally connect. We've uh, been introduced to you multiple times by multiple people saying, yo, you have to connect <laughs> with this guy. And uh, in the first 30 minutes here, man, it uh, it's better than I even expected. Yeah, yeah, likewise. It's like there's so many synergies. And, you know, as I was preparing for the podcast, I'm like, oh, you guys are, it's all about unlearning. Mm -hmm. It's like going that path that we're supposed to go, told we're supposed to go. Yep. And yeah. then it's having crisis, which, which you both experienced, and then doing your own work and your unlearning and then coming back as it turns out to one another mm -hmm. as a completely different person, which is beautiful. So I'm excited to get into that story as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We, we call that, we call that uh, the mainstream script of happiness. I love that. <laughs> so true. We've all heard it. You yeah. Know? It's like, We've all tried to walk that path, yeah. you know? Yep. Well, let's jump in. We have a gang of questions for you. And uh, I know our listeners are eager to learn from you and gain some of your wisdom. Um, but the first question that we ask every guest on The Medicine is, what do you love in your life? What aspect of your life do you love so much that you wish you could gift it to every human? I'd say my freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of, uh, uh, kind of owning my calendar. And I feel like when I get out of alignment with that, there's something going on with me where I've let it get away from me. I think there's so much <sighs> that's when you get to decide how you want to live your life, who you want to spend your time with being able to say no mm. to those people and experiences that aren't going to support the work you want to do and who you want to be around. And I think, I spent a lot of my life, um, while I had a pretty good schedule, I didn't own it. You know, and even today I was contemplating what can I do right now to um, free up more of my time for the things that I, that I really want to do. Um, and I think I've been pulled out of that recently. And it happens. It's going to happen. This is like having the awareness and um, to be able to change that sooner rather than later. And I think this go around, it took me a little bit longer than I would have liked. But, but even in that, like the longer I've stayed in this kind of handcuffed situation, it's reminded me like 
dude, pay attention. Like this mm. is the one thing that I feel like all other things flow out of mm -hmm. because you really get to, to be open or I get to be open and explore and be curious rather than checking the boxes, going to this meeting, having this phone call. And um, yeah, that's, a, I think, a really important thing in our lives. And it looks different for everybody. Some people have jobs that they have to be at for a certain part of the day. Um, it doesn't mean I'm suggesting you need to leave those jobs. It's like, what areas in your life do you really have that agency over? And what would it look like to start to make decisions that open up that time? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes for me, when I get, in that very, um, it's almost like chaotic. I look at the calendar in, in the week ahead. It's like, fuck, I got a lot going on. Generally, it's driven by something else. Mm. It's something that I'm not feeling good enough about myself. And I may be filling my week with things to prove myself to myself or to others. Yeah. yeah. Get that. And it's like, can I, can I really detach from that? Like what really needs to be done? What needs to be attended to? And what is more for that piece, that void that I'm trying to fill? Yeah. Yeah. I it, love that. Freedom is at the root of the masculine desire. <laughs> I think, you know, somebody like David Data would say that it is the purpose of masculinity is to pursue freedom. And it's funny if I like reflect back on my life, the moments I've been so out of balance or in toxic masculinity or just completely out of balance in my life, I have felt bound to something. I have felt obligated to something or not free. Um, and, and there's a couple pieces. I think there's like layers. Like you said, there's different definitions of freedom. Um, but so much of feeling free is really within your own perspective change mm -hmm. and the way that you look at things and even a calendar. Like, um, God, when I was working in, in financial consulting, my calendar was a nightmare. Hmm. Um, but I had agreed to those at some point. And uh, so much of this like journey into freedom as my calendar is still busy as ever is the reframe on how much of this I've already chosen and that I don't have to choose it. Like it doesn't have to be an obligation to prove to myself that I'm busy and being productive because yeah. my calendar is full. And, and I think that's another thing is that the myth of masculinity is that um, to be worthy, I have to produce something. I have to be a, a product that is worthy of progress and evolution and, um, wildly getting comfortable in the spaces of something not on my calendar where you do have the freedom fosters creativity. Mm -hmm. Like in that space of, you know, two or three minutes past boredom is that initiation <laughs> of, of a novel concept. <laughs> An adventure <laughs> and uh, i think we're too afraid of that stillness and we fill our lives with busyness to feel productive and to to yeah. almost fraudulently wear this uh, mask of productivity um but it's beyond the boredom it's it's those moments of discomfort without something to do or something telling you to do like a calendar that you find your deep creativity especially in masculinity which is uh it's an area that i can't say i've mastered um, but I'm genuinely curious as I you know, approach the rest of my 30s, uh, what's going to come from those moments of stillness, those yeah. moments of an open calendar? And, uh, you know, what does my freedom look like? Yeah, I think it's definitely a process. It's a journey. It's like once we know the thing or once we're like, OK, that's what I want it to be. It it, it definitely takes time to transition. And, it, and, you know, we've even like really tried to stop use the stop using the word busy because we're creating our life. and. I don't want to feel that busy energy. Uh, but that's, you know, what a lot of people say, like, oh, how you doing, man? Like, oh, crazy busy, crazy busy, crazy busy. Like, what kind of energy are you inviting into your life when you, you know, like words or spells? And, and so I've definitely like, OK, what other words can I use to describe the feeling of my life that I want to experience? Like, oh, man, life is so full. It's so abundant. Like that feels so much better. And then it's also a reminder, like. I'm choosing everything that I'm doing. You know, no one's making me do any of the things that I'm doing. I'm actively choosing them. And so then actively choosing to, to feel abundant and full rather than just like anxious, busy all the time is like, it's a small thing, but it's a big thing. Yeah. And I, I love that there's like an addiction to busyness. Yeah. And um, we can get caught in that, that kind of vortex of 
as long as, especially, you know, I don't want to speak for the feminine. I barely even want to speak for the masculine, but I think for <laughs> myself, it can feel really good to be engaged in different things that quote unquote need to get done. And, and I love what you said, Chase, like a few minutes past boredom is, is that, that, that's when the that's where the beauty is and i found myself particularly recently as i slip into boredom i reach for something to change my state and you know it's something like feel free which makes me feel really good and i have great energy to do whatever it is and so that in itself isn't a bad thing but when it's like when i slip into boredom it's like I have a really hard time sitting with it. Yeah. And I feel like I've done a lot of work around that. And, um, you know, gosh, and, and I don't want to say I ever came close to mastering it, but was, was really in alignment with that. And, and today I find myself not being comfortable there mm. at all and not knowing how to sit with it. Yeah. yeah. I think for a driven, do you know your Enneagram? Yes, it's so the the you ever hear of a doctor um Jerome Luby? I don't think, I don't so. think so. He does your top 3. Kind of anything, I think over 20 mm -hmm. is he kind of puts them together. And for me it's um 3 7 8. Okay. Ooh, well, that's a fun combo. That's a fun combo. Welcome to the three club. Yeah. It's, fucking, <laughs> as well. it's lethal. It yeah. can be intense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And ask Peyton. Yeah, that's like achiever <laughs> mode. Also, like, I don't really want to listen to authority. Also, like, I can assess what you're doing and probably make it better for you. Uh, seeking fun, novelty, adventure. That's a fun combo. I like, I could see how it would be. <laughs> when it's out of a line, and it's a <laughs> yeah. shit show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's yeah, beautiful. Well, we, but but I resonate with that. I'm I'm almost afraid of stillness and and boredom. And um, I even you know as I'm going about my day and I'm in other tasks, I'm making notes of like, all right, when I get bored, this is what I'm going to do. When I get bored, <laughs> here's the book. Oh my god, that breathwork protocol. I'm definitely going to apply that when I get bored yeah, and start yeah, going crazy. Yeah, but I, yes. and, or like or like, yes. how about I rotate? You know, feel free with. Uh, yeah. biodynamic cannabis and and then i've got ketamine and, yeah. and then it's like and so this is these are my vices and it's all because that stillness is scary legitimately scares me and even something like breath work it's still like escapism to a certain degree yes and so i'm in it with you man I, so I, what do we do about that yeah. yeah like so like the next moment that this comes up for me like what do i do yeah like what do you talk to me here well, I, I want to change the pattern. Yeah, I think um, in those moments for me, like speaking as a feminine, and this is definitely an area that I, I feel, even though I'm a feminine, like I definitely have a very strong masculine side to me and I'm very driven, um, driven individual. But I feel like in the stillness, in those moments of maybe, you know, maybe boredom isn't the right word. Maybe we're using, because there is such a negative connotation with boredom. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't have to explain it. Everyone knows the negative connotation. Is there another word that we could use? Stillness, consciousness, when I'm feeling, um, yeah, I guess still would be the word or serene maybe. Yeah. And so maybe you starting there and then in those moments are usually the moments where if I sit long enough, like I, in my head, I'm like, oh, there you are. Like, that's me. Oh, there you are. Like, I have to like remember that like there's a watcher. And like, but she only gets to watch and I only get to interact with her in those moments of stillness. When we're go, 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 do, 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 B, 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 I don't really feel her, you know, it's all head. And so I, I like to, in those moments, connect with like, oh, there you are. Okay. I feel you. And that's just me. That's probably the essence of divinity. That's the spark of the divine. That's, you could say God. Um, so is that mm -hmm. like our best time to interact with God. I don't know. Yeah. You, you do a great job of that. I'm, I'm so inspired by her. She has a practice of like, and she prioritizes it. It's the first thing in the morning um, where she's developing this relationship with, with herself and, and with, you know, her divinity. And, and that's what I would say is like, that's the thing I want to want. Um, <laughs> I like, I know that's probably what I should be nurturing is this uh, relationship with self, with soul, with, uh, you know, God, however you want to define that. Our mentor, Paul Check. You know, he is the master at having this relationship with his soul. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, we've been to countless workshops and one-on-ones with him. And, and that is the thing that I, I feel the itch or the call towards um, curating and leaning into further. Uh, but man, I'm quick to like find something else to, to fill that space and time where it's like, well, maybe I should work on uh, drafting the next kind of podcast uh, <laughs> agenda instead. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's almost like if I'm hearing you correctly, Mimi, it's when I feel that discomfort start to wash over me, it's like, that's an opportunity to, to lay down and just invite it in. Cause, cause we know like those moments when I've, I've not uh, reached for something to change the state, it does pass. Mm-hmm. And, you know, instead of just letting it pass, maybe that's the opportunity. Cause I'm, I'm just, I don't love sitting down to meditate and I've done it, you know, through uh, a very structured practice on a daily basis. And I saw the benefits of it, but I don't, I don't love it. So I wonder if this, you know, th- this this opportunity appearing, and then that's my call to it. Mm-hmm. Maybe that can look different. And that's your seven coming through. Your type seven, like I don't love this. This isn't that fun. So like, <laughs> yes, I don't want to do it. Like I'm only interested. But I want to in- do it really well because I'm <laughs> yeah. a three. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Exactly. The right. seven and three are like budding heads. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a tough one. I think that we all have to find our our flavor of stillness. Like I don't think it has to look the same as Paul Check or, you know, some other spiritual guru or whatever. But yeah, I think uh finding your flavor of how do you connect best which actually leads perfectly into the next question yeah. that we have. We love a good segue. We love that. We love <laughs> a good segue. Um how do you define God? You know, I was gonna say, like, what's your ideal set up to feel God, feel the divine in your life. So kind of transitioning to the next question, how do you define God, spirituality? Do you subscribe to any sort of epistemology, um, anything like that? And, and how do you interact with that entity that you call God? I would say it's most profound for me, and I don't kind of subscribe to any, any one kind of ideology, but when when I'm in crisis, Mm -hmm. when I feel that coming on and I feel everything closing in and like my world feels like it's falling apart and I'm trying to figure out what the fuck just happened to get me here. When I can just sit with it and breathe and know, you know, like zoom out and know that this is happening for me. I just don't know what it's going to look like and just accept that this is where I'm at and I may be catastrophizing it in the moment, but it's not that bad and I can start to peel things away. And I I think in those moments, I'm in touch with, you know, my higher soul, whatever you'd want to describe it as. And there's some comfort there. It's like, okay, like I don't know how this is going to turn out. But generally, when I've been in a situation like this, some real good has happened. It's just real shitty right now. Mm-hmm. So I think it's in those times when I, and I don't do it every time, unfortunately. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I let it fester and I ruminate and it becomes a a bigger issue. But but I would say when I can just, yeah, zoom out and look almost a little bit more objectively at at what's happening and then start to bring in the things that are working. It's like balance that out and then just trust that I need to stay in the process of of what's unfolding. And then that's where the the real learning is through our own life experience. Mm. Yeah, I I hear surrender like in those yes. moments, like when you're in a crisis or stressful times, and you, you're almost like pushed to it. Um, surrender, but that's your feminine, right? Like that's totally. That's yeah. like that's not that's not an easy one. <laughs> no, and, and, and it's not easy to surrender. It's it, it's sort of portrayed as a passive type of thing, but it is actively powerful to sit in that moment and you have the fork in the road to surrender 
or to, oh, I'm going to fucking barrel through this and like, you know, resist the surrender. But I mean, we've all probably had that experience in some sort of plant medicine ceremony. And like, how does that go? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then life gives us those moments, I think, on a day to day basis to surrender. Well, and when you're driven and you are, you know, achievement oriented, you are hyper focused on these strategies, the protocols, the tools, the resources that are going to give you step A to Z on how to troubleshoot a problem. And um, when you have to surrender or when you have to lean into, you know, th this is all this is all knowledge in the form of memorizing definitions and uh, executing protocols. And it's using our rational, logical brain. But when we have to give in to the fact that experiential knowledge is the surrender of everything that I can recite and rather I'm going to jump and throw myself into this with no outcome uh, that is predictable. I can't forecast this. And so it's going to be a learning opportunity, whether I get it right or whether I fuck up. And wildly enough, fucking up is the best way to learn. <laughs> so like <laughs> or unlearn or yeah. unlearn. Exactly. Which is this like, okay, I'm going to, I have enough context. I have enough of the formula and the protocol. It's only going to get me so far. I got to lean into the experience of this thing and t take the pill of chance that I'm going to fuck up. On the other side of that is an opportunity to learn. It's to catalyze that um, failure, quote unquote. Or it's, a, it's something that you can work through intuitively. And it's, it's kind of nurturing both of those. Um, I think we're, we're it turns in, uh, into a stumbling block is when you lose the perspective of a failure being an opportunity to learn and it turns into this snowball effect of self-deprecation and yeah. um, flogging oneself for your failures. Um, and so, yeah, like, again, I, I, this is all great to say in theory, but it's like when you get into that moment and you're like, all right, I got to now step into the unknown and uh, be comfortable with the chance that I fail. Yeah. Yeah, and this is why I love doing podcasts because the things that are coming up right now with the questions you're asking are like really what I'm being called to. And so mm -hmm. it's a reminder. And then you you both know as you say those own words out of your mouth, mm -hmm. it just lands differently. And it's it's the reminder that um yeah, it's <laughs> it's very uh, apropos today. So yeah, I really appreciate it. Totally. So I'm sure a ton of our listeners have listened to your show maybe even heard you on other shows. I'm sure we, we cross audiences to a certain degree, but you know, quickly, maybe a little bit of your background, uh, what you're doing today that is like really beautifully impacting a ton of lives um, and how you got there, just like briefly, two or three sentences. Yeah, so I, as you mentioned, I was a trader in Chicago up until, well, I guess, nine years ago. And in, uh, I love that you brought up David Data because I was reading The Way of the Superior Man at a coffee shop and read the chapter about you know, kind of your connection to a project that you're working on. And if it's, you could leave that project unfinished without any regrets, you know, he rearticulates it like five different ways. He's like, it's time for you to leave that project. I was like, oh, fuck, it's time for me to leave trading. And this was after 18 years, a deep brotherhood there, um, the same group that, you know, I joined out of college. I'd been a partner there for 15 years. Wow. You know, the, the head guy was very much a father figure and mentor to me. All the guys there were my best friends in Chicago. And it was time to leave. Uh, and so left that, got into actually got into coaching um, a lot around physical training, nutrition, lifestyle stuff. I was really interested in that for my own life and then kind of started to coach people uh done a few different things so, i mean that that was kind of short-lived i probably did that for a couple of years and and since then i've been doing a lot of personal investing and so mm. being engaged in in kind of different opportunities which i think we'll probably get into a little bit later when we talk more about finances but i've really spent my time over the last couple of years with the podcast um i've run a few kind of mastermind workshops and then just trying to show up for my family and the community in a way that feels different, you know, than, than maybe it, it was before. What was the scariest part when you were facing that I need to leave or I, you know, it's time for me to step away from this. 
what was the the scariest part or the voice that was but wait what about this you know was there any of that going on and, and what was what was that like that's a great question and I, I it's one of those things where I just knew it in every you know kind of cell in my body that it was time to leave so when that light bulb turned on it's like oh it's very clear um so that wasn't difficult and even leaving chicago and you know my best friends there that that wasn't hard either i would say that it came afterwards maybe three four five years down the road when i hadn't properly of mourning is the right word, but there was there was a part of me, there was an identity that that I was letting go of, and I was ready to let go of it, but I, I didn't understand that it had been such a part of, you know, obviously very formative years, and um, I think it kind of snuck up on me, and, you know, years later where that sense of um, kind of bringing home the bacon and, and, you know, being that. And it's not like I don't do that through these other investments. But when you're, when you're kind of a layer away from that, when you're investing in somebody else versus yourself, mm. it's very different. And, and I think down the road, I started to feel some sense of unworthiness because I wasn't bringing home a check based on the work I was doing. Uh, I've since made amends with that, uh, but it was something that I struggled with and I didn't even know that's what it was. But there was this sense of like, oh, come on, man, like you're just betting on other people. Mm -hmm. you know, and so I think once I started the podcast, it was my way to coach and share in a way that wasn't transactional. Yeah. And it was just like, here, this is my experience and the experience of my guests for you. Do with it what you'd like. Um, that's, that's kind of my work to do right now. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a muscle of unconditional love, right? Is to work without an expectation attached to it. And, uh, again, going back to creativity and freedom and, and those moments of, of boredom, I think culturally and, and especially for like achievers, type three achievers, we are conditioned to have an outcome uh, or an expectation for an outcome on anything we, we do and we get attached to that outcome. What happens then is we're so focused on that very specific narrow outcome that we miss out on the current moment. We miss out on presence, which is where boredom occurs, which is where creativity uh, is surfaced. And that's been something, you know, I'm a, I'm an athlete before I even was, uh, you know, working in, in a financial career and it's always achievement outcome oriented. And there's such an attachment to the very specific definition of an outcome um, when it pertains to anything that I'm working towards. And so, yeah, it is a, it is a massive, uh, it's working out. It's like building a brand new muscle uh, or, or accessing a recruitment pattern that you've never used before to do something simply for the act of love that is the creativity of it. And, and not for the purpose of a, a transaction or, or an outcome with it. So, man, that, that resonates deeply. Yeah, and what I, what I recognized, you know, in doing the podcast, that I was actually, it took me a little while, but I was actually, wasn't doing it for the audience, no offense to anyone listening, but I was really <laughs> doing it for myself. Yeah. It was my own classroom to explore these ideas, whether it was on a solo cast or with a guest or several guests. Like, let's just play in this space and be curious. And it's something that I hadn't been curious in that way in a, in a long time, maybe, yeah. maybe ever. Right? We go through this education system that doesn't invite that. And I was good at following the rules and giving the answers that needed to be given. But, you know, as I've kind of stepped into this next chapter it's really been about being curious and what does that look like mm -hmm. yeah we pulled this uh this quote from your website <laughs> and uh, we've heard you kind of dance around this this topic uh often on your on your show but you say creating a life you love is about becoming aware of the parts of our lives and ourselves that are true and the parts that aren't and as we do this an entirely new and more fulfilling way of being emerges so what have been some of those significant parts of yourself or your life 
that you've evaluated and come to that maybe that conclusion. Maybe you call that the unlearning process. And uh, where would you suggest people start as they take inventory of their own lives? I'd say part of it is in parenting. Mm. And, you know, for me, I grew up, my dad was, was pretty strict. He was pretty hard on, on, on me and my sister. Uh, my mom, not so much. She was kind of the, the security blanket. I didn't really like that. And, you know, I, I made a very conscious decision to not be like him. And the problem with that was I kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater. And there were some things that he held boundaries on, you know, that, that maybe I didn't understand as a kid, but did serve me well. And I think in trying to so not be like that and have a different experience for my kids that I overcorrected. Mm. And I was too much at times the cool dad. You know, I wanted to be understanding. I wanted to give them a space to share what's up. I wanted them to feel like they could come to me with anything and not get in trouble. That if they were in trouble, yeah. I would be the one they would call versus trying to figure it out themselves if it was that kind of danger. In doing that, it just, it, it created some, some leaky boundaries. And so I'm still learning what does that look like? How can I incorporate the things, you know, that, that I didn't appreciate about my dad when I was growing up, but that I do appreciate now. And, you know, that was his way. I've come to understand and really believe that that was his way of showing love. He just didn't know how to do it necessarily as much with his heart. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd say, you know, that's, that's been, you know, as my kids are getting older, it's like, how, what does that look like as they get older? They, they have more responsibility. They have more freedom. How do I still keep them in a safe container? Because they're seeking that too, even though they're not wanting it. There's a part of their soul that really needs that. Yeah. So that's been a big one for me, I would say. Of course there is, no matter how hard we try, like, and we're not parents yet, but no matter how hard we try, there's going to be things that our kids have to undo. I am like fully accepting that. I'm reading all the conscious parenting books now. I'm listening to the <laughs> podcasts. I'm learning about natural birth. I'm learning about all these things. I want to do it in a way that, you know, uh, sets my kid up in, in a way that they don't have to untangle the same things that I did, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to have to untangle something. And that's, you know, that's what we're here on earth to do is, is to take our circumstances and treat them as catalysts. And how do we learn from this? Okay, like that parent-child relationship is like the first place that that's available to us as humans is what are my parents offering me in the form of love, in the form of discipline, in the form of knowledge, in the fo form of a home environment? How is my soul going to use this to evolve? And so like your kids are just facing the opposite end of the spectrum probably than you did. And I identify with with the, with the childhood that you had, like super hardcore, like strict father, evangelical Christian, like it was pretty rough. Um, no abuse or anything like that. I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, put that out there, but it was really, really strict. And, uh, in me swinging this way, you know, with my future, our future kid, like, I know that I'm going to be swinging, like, and I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm noting that, like, is there a middle ground, you know? Um, do you feel like you've, you've found that middle ground? I have, and it's taken me a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, it's remembering that each kid actually has different needs. And so, you know, e even like school is a kind of a, a good example for me because my parents never had any involvement with my school. I was al always driven to do well that was the you know the competitive nature coming out and you know my kids have different needs around that some of them some you know some need some oversight some nudging some help with structure um you know i kind of took that approach of they're going to have their own experience with it and if they're not showing up to do the work then the school the teacher will support them and that's just not the way it works it sounds good on paper but you know, I think being more involved and more attuned to what they need, you know, and again, that was a, a bit of a reaction to what I saw around in the community. Like 
moms being so involved. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, I'm not going to be that parent. <laughs> and, you know, again, it doesn't, there's some benefits to what they're doing. And I think it's just being discerning and, and really um, not reactive to, you know, trying to not be like someone. I think that's probably where the biggest growth for me has come. Like, oh, there's some good shit there, actually. And mm-hmm. even though I wouldn't parent like that, that's her way of showing love. Okay, great. Like, what, what's, what would work for me and for my kid from what I'm learning here? And I think that's really where I'm kind of coming to with a lot of things. Like, just like, where can you pull out the nuggets of something that wholly you don't agree with? But there's got to be something in there that's a benefit. Yeah. yeah isn't isn't totally. it wild when we drill things down? They're quite simple. We've got complex issues all over the place, but the solutions don't necessarily have to be complex. Not saying they're going to be easy, but they're quite simple. And so much of it can actually be distilled down to not too much, not too little. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, how do you, and I would imagine with parenting, how do you allow your kid to go to the edge, slip real quick and go, fuck, I can't go there. Yeah. But keep them from jumping off. I mean, I think that's the you know, mystery of parenting, but it's like, all right, masculinity is container and leadership, but it's also safety. How do I nurture this with my children, which are you know, innately feminine until they're, until they're of maturity and, and have more of a, a masculine dominance? But it's that, where is the container? Where's the line? Where's, how, how gray can this line truly be? I, I wish that my, and, and again, the community that we come from, evangelical Christianity is like, it's like living in a cellar. You know? it's, uh, <laughs> it's brutal and, and the guilt Very and the shame that's yeah. associated with it. So of yeah. course I wish for for more uh, freedom, but you know, would I have done something reckless? I had a pretty traumatic, free childhood for the most part, and uh, sure, it was uh, frustrating as far as not being able to su- do certain things, and you know, the amount of guilt and shame that we had for you know, fucking around as teenagers, <laughs> like it's unreal. But um, again, it's like it's it's the mystery. Something we'll figure out, I guess, when we're we're parenting or maybe not. But it reminds me of something that Paul Check said, and I don't know if he, he said it from his own brain or if he was quoting someone, but you never know. <laughs> you never know. Um, he said, if you never find your edges, you'll never find your center. And it's so fucking true. Yeah. And if you don't do it as a teenager, which is like, that's hopefully when you are st- sort of like putting your toe out, like finding the edge, hopefully you don't go off the edge because you don't have a lot of tools and you know, hopefully you have a support system, but like there is, I think, um, if you don't do that as a teenager, there's going to be, uh, an opportunity as an adult where you feel the, the need or the urge to do that. Certainly when we were, uh, you know, we were high school sweethearts, we were together for 10 years, um, got married and we were, you know, we had only had each other really from teenage years on. And we never had that, like, really find your edges aside from just, you know, fooling around with each other. But like other other than that, there was never of any opportunity or desire really to find our edges, I think. And we get to be 26, 27 years old and there is something that's gnawing at us and we probably wouldn't have been able to name it. But I think, you know, when, when we did separate and kind of getting into our story, I guess, but um, when we did separate, there was definitely that urge from both of us to like, hey, I never did this and I need to go find my, find my edges. And then we, you know, as adults, we usually do that pretty, pretty hard because yeah. we, because we have the resources and we, uh-huh. you know, we're yeah. not, we're not necessarily hurting anyone else. So it's like, fuck it, here we go. Yeah, so let's let's I'd love for for my listeners, I'm sure your listeners have have heard the story, but what did that look like? You yeah. know, the 2016, how long were y'all married for? So we were married for 3 years. We uh, were childhood sweethearts, so we'd known each other since we were 15 years old. We dated through high school, we dated through college, and uh in the evangelical community, um the Christian community that we come from, it's like you don't live together unless you're married. Yeah, and, there was no um, option. And even though like, you know, for instance, my family wasn't wasn't just adamant Christians necessarily. It was just kind of culturally part of the uh, the script. And so we did just that. We were together. We had a like perfect teenage romance. I mean, it's like we're like 90s 
kids in suburban America, like cruising up at the lake in the summers. It's like Dawson's Creek yeah. level. No drama. Corny romance. And, and it was just amazing. It was just bliss. So much play. And um, we followed the script. Neither one of us were, were legitimately in our souls ready to transition from child archetype into adult. Um, but when we graduated college, we followed the script. We got married, a beautiful wedding in Priest Lake, Idaho, and uh, jumped right into adult life. We moved to Seattle, Washington. I was working at Deloitte & Touche, um, started out in like the audit practice um, and, and spent quite a bit of time in, at Deloitte altogether. But it was, it was intense, man. It was, it was, I can't say that I enjoyed uh, the job. I was on an airplane every Monday and Friday. Um, so we're 23 years old, brand spanking new after this blissful childhood romance. And we're like full-fledged adults. Yeah. We've got debt from college. We've got, um, you know, brand new careers. Me being a, a former athlete, always successful in pretty much everything I did. I'm the lowest man on the totem pole at a very political cutthroat um, environment, traveling all over the place. And slowly but surely, um, three after three years of kind of just this ease in the relationship, we and taking probably like 10% deviations away from each other as time goes on. You know, it's like every Friday that I show back, show up back at the home, I'm a little more disconnected. I'm a little more stiff and <clears throat> frozen. Um, play, which was this pillar of our relationship, uh, was just so absent. And we were in just complete reaction of our yeah. environment and the way that we were feeling. And so we get three years into this. Um, and I, having always been in love with Southern California, get a really great opportunity at the firm to take a, a promotion and uh, to jump into the Southern California um, financial consulting space. And I'm like, all right, this is it. This is going to save things because it was just a cold, distant relationship. The last year of our marriage, very specifically, and this is like 2015, 16. And so I kind of just make the decision as the man of the household to, uh, that we're going to move to California and this is kind of be our saving grace. And, um, you know, a week or two before we were set to move, we had an apartment, we had moving trucks, everything scheduled, ready to go. Um, Megan approaches me and, uh, you know, essentially says, um, I'm, I'm not going. And, uh, you know, not just that, I, I think we should, we should separate and we should you know, end this, uh, relationship. And so, you know, for me, the most traumatic thing that ever, ever happened to me, I, uh, quickly, could uh, you see that coming? You know, were you just like, there's no way we're going to split up. It's just, we're going through a hard time. That was it. Yeah. It was, there's no way we're going to split up. We're soulmates. We've been doing this forever. Um, we've been together 10 years, you know, marriage and dating. And I knew there was, there was issues and I had chalked it up in my ignorance to, um, we're not in the right city. This isn't the right job for me. I need to, I need to stop traveling so much. If I move into consulting, this is going to fix the problems. Um, I'll make some more money down there too. <laughs> She'll be happy when we, ha when we have more money. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Which gonna, every woman beach. right now yeah. is listening and like, Oh my God. No. Um, <laughs> and so that, that was what I had kind of painted this story, uh, in my mind. And, uh, so it was surprising. The divorce was very surprising. The <clears throat> unhappiness, you know, I'd said things like we can get con like help if we want, like marriage counseling, if we, if you want, you know, that was my thing. If you want to, try to try to fix this and um so that was surprising in my bitterness my response was actually fuck that this is gonna be the worst decision you ever made and um i didn't really try to fight it uh, i didn't beg put my shit in my car tv and my clothes i drove down to san diego and uh started my life over yeah i it was very it was very very cold from from my end, it was very abrupt. It was very cold. There was no emotion in my face. I had told myself stories for the year prior. So it wasn't out of the blue for me. Um, but one of my lessons in this life has been learning how to use my voice and match it to my feelings and to be able to articulate that to the people that I love, to myself. And uh, so I was not doing that at all. So I was very unhappy um, you know, in the last two years of our, of our marriage, but I didn't know how to share with Chase and we were both very out of balance. So when it would come up, 
probably not in a balanced way, probably more like projectile tears. And Chase is like, I don't know what the fuck to do here. Um, It was it was it was unbalanced. And so he didn't know how to use that information and help us. And uh, we just we didn't have any tools. You get married young like that. You have no idea who you are or what you want to do in the world, who you want to be, what you want to experience. We had zero tools for healthy communication. Zero. We did premarital counseling. It was BS, um, you know, and, and I think a lot of people experience that. You kind of check the box of premarital counseling, mm. but it really doesn't get into the meat. You know, you talk about, oh, do you want kids? Uh, you know, broad topics like finances and like gender roles and things like that, which are, you know, important to a degree, but also like, what are you going to do when you're both crazy stressed and you're disconnected? What are you going to do? How do you give feedback sexually in a way that your partner can digest? Um, what do you do when uh, you're completely out of balance in uh, in your health? And how do you come back together and figure it out? Like there was no there were no tools for any of that. And so those were all the things that we were facing and didn't know how to you know, figure out together. So we spent three years figuring out that we had nothing figured out. Um, and so for, for me in that conversation, it was, um, I've made up my mind and I'm, I'm, it was, it was like, I'm telling you what I want. And Chase did push back a little bit in the beginning, but it, it was very much like, nope, we're married. This is what we do. We made a commitment. It's a contract. We're going to see this through. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> we gave, you know, integrity. We gave each other our word. There was no like, I love you. I can't live without you. Not that that's necessarily healthy. I can't live without you. But, you know, all the things that a woman wants to hear from her person is like, I love you. You're the only one. Like there was none of that. It was all just like masculine, like, you know, black and white. Yes. And uh, so it wasn't it didn't. It didn't sway me. Yeah, (laughs) I, I had my mind made up at that point. And Chase you know, saw. I absolutely knew, you know, I, I looked her in the eyes and I knew it was, knew it was over, knew it was gone. And uh, so I really didn't fight it. Um, and I'm so glad I, I didn't. Um, it was the best thing that ever happened to us. You know, I bombed down to California and um, I bury this thing in my soul. Like I shed like five tears and then I was just on, I was on to the next thing. And that meant um, I was going to work my ass off in my career, I'm gonna move up the firm's ladder. I'm going to work out. I'm 26 and single and I've never kissed another girl. This is my childhood sweetheart. 26 and single in Southern California. Let's give this thing a go. Um, and then I'm, I'm exercising and I get compulsive about the way that I work out and my diet and my fitness, nutrition. And, um, and so I do that for a while. Um, and I just completely burn out. You know, I'm probably a year and a half into this. Of course, initially it's like crushing it at the firm. Um, I look great, ripped. Um, and having a you know robust social life in, in Pacific Beach and Southern California and in San Diego and uh, seemingly doing quite well. Um, I get about a year and a half into this and at 27, I just hit a complete brick wall. Um, it starts physically and it's a physical um, just exhaustion, adrenal exhaustion. Mm-hmm. I lose 30 pounds in six weeks and I'm working crazy hours, you know, and, and, um, it was such a hard uh, message from the universe that change needed to happen. And so while I was still ignoring the, the traumatic uh, emotional and spiritual impact of the divorce, um, I couldn't ignore how much physically I was just ailing. And so I actually left, I left uh, uh, the firm and uh, it wasn't an easy, easy decision, but I was very much ready. And I had uh, gravitated towards Um, You know, I just gotten so unwell physically and despite working out and eating okay. And so I'm like, there's something more to this than just burning calories, lifting weights and eating, fitting my macros. And um, so I kind of get into the uh, the holistic health and wellness space. And I start like, uh, you know, the the bro scientist that I am. I start with uh, <laughs> podcasts and it's, it's Sean Stevenson, it's Ben Greenfield, it's some of the OGs in this space. And um, I start connecting with the community in, in San Diego and uh, actually meet uh, Drew Canoli, who's the founder of Organifi. And they had, they had just started at the time. I fall in love with these people. Um, and so I was actually, I left Deloitte for, uh, to, to help uh, Organifi. 
And uh, it was really early on. Uh, there was only a handful of us at the time. And, and I'm still there. I'm the, I'm the CFO at Organifi now. Um, but that community really changed my life. Um, started physically, learning about adaptogens. This thing called medicinal mushrooms uh, are just magically impacting my adrenals. I get so fascinated by this. I thought mushrooms were just this, you know, goofy psychedelic. And um, slowly but surely, I, I'm, I'm healing myself physically and being exposed to the healing that's beyond the physical, which is the psychological and the spiritual. And I get really interested in like Toltec wisdom. Who's this Don Miguel Ruiz mm. guy? Who's this Joe Dispenza guy? And, and um, I'm picking up on some of these modalities for moving on from trauma. I, I'd, I'd gotten to be quite aware of the fact that I'd never really addressed this divorce thing. And um, I was very much, I had left Christianity long ago and was very, very tunneled down into scientific materialism and, and the real bitterness and disdain for uh, religion. Um, but sure enough, through a plant medicine experience, through, through a, a pretty heavy dose of psilocybin, I had experienced the divine and knew that there was something beyond the physical. All of this stuff is just accumulating. And I'm like, damn it, I need to start addressing this, uh, this divorce. And I go through a pretty robust uh, protocol. Of course, I'm like finding protocols and, and like, how do I, you know, <laughs> achieve this and work through this? But it's, a, it's kind of a, re a rewiring of, of what it means to move on and forgive. And, and I began to really meditate on not just what it looks like to forgive Megan for the divorce, um, but to get to a point where the best version of myself includes rooting for her. That when I think of her, it's not bitterness. Mm. That, that when I think of her, it's, I'm, I'm like excited for what she's doing. And I don't, I haven't, we haven't talked in three years. We, we, I mean, deleted numbers, deleted pictures, but I can't stop thinking about her. I'm thinking about her every single day. And so for me, it was like, I'm not just going to like get over this. I'm going to get to the point where when I think of her and I have this thought of her and I see a you know, beautiful woman on the street that reminds me of her, which happened all the time, um, I would be lit up with how much I was hoping and knowing that she was succeeding and happy. And where did you learn this kind of particular mindset from? Uh, it, most of this was organic, uh, but, it, but it, it occurred to me through Joe Dispenza's uh, very specifically breaking the habit of being yourself. He talked about healing and these stories of people healing through uh, this, this uh, you know, heart brain coherence. And I was like, I, I wonder if I can apply this to um, forgiveness. And every time, because I, I just couldn't stop thinking about her and I couldn't move on. And um, I had wanted, he has this protocol for when you want to, you know, when you're thinking those looping default mode patterns of negativity and pessimism that you just say out loud, you say change, change. And um, I just started to do that. And the change for me was not just forgiveness, but I'm like, I'm going to go above forgiveness. I'm going to go way upstream and actually, I don't even need to think about forgiveness if I'm rooting for her, if I'm her biggest advocate. Even if she never knows, I'm just going to be her biggest advocate. And um, that's what it led to. And it's funny, I still walk around Coronado and I'll, we'll be at like a, a you know, intersection. I'll be like, this intersection, I, I used to say change right here because yeah. I, I think about you. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so that was, that was it. Meanwhile, were you yeah. feeling any of this? Oh, as, yeah. yeah. Yes. We, like you said, we were not talking. Like it was like, we're divorced. You know, there was no like, let's see how this goes. And maybe in a year, like there was mm. none of that. But I was on my own journey and I, I won't go deep, deep, deep into the details, but I was on my own health and wellness and healing journey, you know, healing myself, addressing the shame and the judgment and the blame that I carried with myself from how I handled myself uh, in our relationship and then through our divorce. Um, that was, you know, I, I was carrying a big bag of shame with me everywhere I went to the point where I was convinced that no one would ever love me, that I didn't necessarily deserve love that I was a monster. Um, and, uh, I, I knew that no one would ever love me fully because I would never show them all of me fully. So that gets really heavy <laughs> after a while. Um, it's really, really hard to experience that day in and day out. Wasn't telling anyone what was going on in me. I was a health coach at the time. So it felt like I was living this double life. Mm -hmm. Um, I was facing all sorts of chronic health issues um, I can help people lose weight, but I couldn't figure out why my hair was falling out or why I had a rash on half of my body or why I couldn't digest any of my food or why my face was blowing up in acne. 
So I was facing a lot of physical problems, but also emotional. Same as Chase, where he's like, I never addressed this. I never addressed it. And it was like screaming at me to like, you need to address this, let it go, release it, deal with it. And so I actually moved back home with my parents when I was 28 years old, 20, 29. And that was a little bit of a, an ego kick um, <laughs> that I'm forever grateful for them for taking me in and, and giving me a space where I could focus on my own healing, stepped away from my very busy dental hygiene job and just really focused on myself for a year. How long were you at home for? About a year. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so <clears throat> I was able to address the physical stuff and the emotional stuff. And I was on my own spiritual path too. Like I started really asking questions about how we were raised, what I wanted to believe. I was studying Jesus's words rather than um, just listening to people's sermons. Like I was like, this guy, Jesus seemed like he had it figured out. I really want to study him instead of the Old Testament, instead of the whole Bible. What did he say? How did he live? So I started reading books and, you know, around that. And so I was on my own spiritual path. And so I would sit, you know, really started getting into meditation and just, and, and, it was prayer, but it was meditation. And I would sit in my room, you know, for 30 minutes at night, just connecting, trying to connect my soul to the divine at the time I was calling it God or Jesus, whatever. And in those moments of stillness, just by myself in my room, I would think about my future partner, you know, from this sort of balanced state and try to literally picture my heart with a tether to the heart of the individual that I would eventually meet. And that was my person. I had no idea that it was going to end up being my ex-husband. <laughs> uh, that was a funny little wrench there. Little plot twist. But yeah. it was so real sitting in these moments. You know, I'm sitting here sometimes in, in my own pool of tears because I feel it so deeply. And there was certain times where I would feel it deeply. And I would actually, uh, a couple of times I texted him and, um, you know, just feeling like I need to release this. And so I would text him and like, hey, you know congrats on the new job or whatever. And I hope you're doing well. And, uh, you know, I, I was just, I myself was getting to a place where I was able to even approach, uh, communication with him because I had released enough shame, blame and judgment, but actively connecting, you know, my heart to the heart of my future person. So I definitely felt whatever he was doing. I definitely felt my soul felt Um, and super, I'm very confident that we were having very sort of mirrored experiences. Uh, once we got back together, we we started sharing the details of when we were apart. I was like, holy shit, holy shit. That happened to you too. Like we both hit adrenal hormonal rock bottoms, literally clawing our way out of this hell hole and, uh, really nursing ourselves back to, back to health from scratch. And, um, and a part of that was also the emotional and, and spiritual side yeah, as so, well. So wildly, this thing called medicinal mushrooms ends up being the uh, catalyst, the medium for us to connect because it's it's like, wait, you left your career for holistic health and wellness. Um, so did I. You know, she had left dental yeah. hygiene. She's uh, working through you know Instagram education to talk about medicinal mushrooms and uh, building her own business online. And so we just like actually have a really organic connection through uh, our our healing physical healing Mm. um it turns into i'm back home for the holidays and uh, we decide to meet up for coffee and this is after three years of not seeing each other barely even talking except for a couple you know mushroom texts and uh so we connect and and you know what was intended to be a you know quick catch up ends up being hours and hours and hours of closing the coffee shop down um we just have this really you know we're not addressing anything from the divorce and we just have this really beautiful um friendship uh connection and, uh, you know, I leave and I go back to Southern California. I'm like, all right, man, closure. Yeah. <laughs> meanwhile, yeah. <laughs> like, meanwhile, I get in my car after this meetup. We, you know, say goodbye, hug, whatever. And it was very friendly, very platonic the whole time. Like there, it wasn't like full of a lot of motion or anything. And I just lost my shit. I was, it was just projectile crying because like, I didn't realize how much my soul missed his soul. And like, I just missed my best friend because when we were apart, I didn't let myself go there because like you're homegirl, you're the one that ended it. Like you don't get to be sad. You don't get to miss him. You don't get to miss Priest Lake. You don't get to miss your memories together. Like you did this. What do you expect? And so all of that pent up emotion, 
that I just never let myself go there and like really feel into how much I missed him. <sighs> Man, that was heavy. And I uh, uh, immediately went to my sister's house afterwards who lived in the same city. And I was just I told her about it. And she was like, jaw dropped, like, you did what? You met up with Chase for four hours? And uh, yeah, from, from there, it just like cracked the door for me to continue. Like he was like, oh, my God, closure. I, you know, I was like, wow, I missed his soul so much. And I, I wasn't like trying to like, I need him back in my life. I need him as my husband again. Like it wasn't like that. It was just allowing myself to, to feel how much I missed him. Yeah. So we, we stay in touch. Um, and then again, just universe, uh, completely synchronized. We have this just happenstance, uh, health conference in Anaheim, California that we are both attending for our livelihoods, for our work. And uh, we're like, yeah, let's connect. Let's, let's uh, you know, make sure to see each other when we're there. Um, it's a four-day event. We connect day one and, and we basically don't, don't detach. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have just nothing but, but beautiful chemistry. Um, the third night, we end up in, in uh, Megan's rental car and we're just sitting, waiting out traffic and, and we start getting into it. We start talking about uh, the marriage and the divorce. The and heavy stuff. It's like... I had no fucking idea what I was doing. Like, I am, I'm so sorry. You know, it's both of us uh, exchanging this and we have some really beautiful conversation. It feels like we're 16 back in high school, yeah. you know, listening and, uh, to, you know, music in the car or something. Holding hands, like trying to comfort each other yeah. and ourselves at the same time. And, um, that night, you know, I, I'm going to drive back to San Diego and this is kind of going to be it. And, uh, I don't know what came over me. It was just, uh, it was just divine. And, and, um, we're, we're about to say goodbye. And I, uh, I grab her face and I stare at her in the eyes. Um, and I'm, I'm aware of the fact that, you know, when we parted, there was nothing left. Like the, the girl that I was deeply in love with was absent in those eyes. And, and so I think I was looking, I think I was looking for if she was there and if that spark of her soul was there and it, it really was. And um, again, like this was no strategy. It was just complete channeling of something. I just grabbed her face and I kissed her and um, I just said, I love you. And um, you know, she said it back and, uh, I drove back to, to San Diego and it was like, okay, there's more, there's a, there's yeah. a sequel here. There's a sequel. <laughs> um, uh, took to, to long story short, um, she comes and takes a couple of visits to San Diego to see if this is something we can do. We can date maybe as ex-husband <laughs> and ex-wife. And in, uh, six months after that kiss in Anaheim, she moves in to my condo in Coronado, California, uh, actually completely random on our, was it sixth, sixth wedding, wedding anniversary? anniversary. Um, yeah, it was well, crazy. It was a total then, accident. And then, so we're, so we're, and then we kick it off. We go to Burning Man the next week. Yeah. And uh, that's the kickoff to part yeah. two. <laughs> These couple of Christian, Christian kids like kicking off part two, ex-husband, ex-wife. Yeah. Throwing it down and burning, <laughs> burning and man. We, we, uh, we start our business, our podcast and our, our medicinal mushroom business, you know, shortly thereafter. And it's been We've been back together three and a half years now. Officially longer in part two than we were married. So, yes. <laughs> so that is it. That is the long-winded uh, version. It, yeah. We gave you a lot of details. So thanks for thanks for holding space, man. Oh, really. thanks for sharing. Like amazing. What like your families as you all were coming back together? What was the kind of general reaction? My family uh, was generally, they, they had seen me go through some rough times and they uh, wanted me to be happy. My family also loved Chase. So for the most part, it was like, if you're happy doing this and if he, you know, um, you're, you feel like this is right for you. There was a little bit of pushback um, from uh, one of my siblings um, who had kind of gotten used to this version of me, this Seattleite, socialite, party version, drinking version. Let's talk about the guy I'm dating or whatever it is. So she had kind of gotten used to that version of me. So there was a little pushback of like, if you change, what does that do to our relationship? But overall, you know, that didn't last very long. Um, but that was really the only pushback from anyone in my family. And Chase's was a little bit different. Yeah, it was a, it was a, you know, there was a period of concern um, of, uh, hey, do you remember how really awful this was and sudden this was and you know, there was trust violated and, and um, so. And how convenient that your 
living in a beautiful condo in a tropical island in California and she just stumbles back into <laughs> your life. How <laughs> convenient for her. There was a little bit of that. <laughs> sure, but. sure. And but it but it was only until they witnessed us uh, yeah. together and they saw the you know bright, shiny version of this relationship um, and saw the fruit of, of what it meant in our lives uh, together that uh, it's been our families are one family. Uh, yeah. Her siblings are my siblings and vice versa. And so it's been nothing but uh, support and love really yeah. ever since. And it was, it was, I would say anything but convenient, you know, yes. like. There was, yeah, definitely some external noise from a little bit of family, but a lot of, a lot of friends, external noise. And, you know, I'm, from my perspective, I'm coming into his life where everyone he knows, his, his core group of friends knows about this heartbreak. So I'm, you know, climbing a steep hill, coming back. They all know my name. They all know what happened between us. And I'm, you know, climbing a steep hill to basically there was definitely times where I felt like I had to prove that I was a good person, that I had to prove that I was worthy of love. And that's, you know, that's my own stuff. Mm. But this was definitely an opportunity where I, uh, it was an opportunity to start telling myself a new story that, nope, I'm, I'm here, I'm alive and I exist. That makes me worthy of love. Yeah, no. And, and same. Cause I, you know, I was like, I was a stone cold asshole, uh, as a husband. And so there was a lot of opportunities to, revisit that version of myself, those, those emotions that surface when, uh, you know, I would have violent outbursts of screaming, not because I was, um, you know, directed at her or, or anything. It was just, it was just compartmentalized, um, lack of freedom is really what it came down to is I didn't feel freedom in my life. And so the, the dish would break in the, in the kitchen and I would freaking lose it, just lose my shit. And, um, it was those types of things that set our life, uh, as unstable. And it wasn't directly towards her in the relationship. There was no abuse, but it was, oh, wow, this environment is not emotionally safe, which it, is a yeah. pillar of masculinity is mm. safety. It was, oh, wow. I never want that directed at me. I better stay quiet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the story. We're still unwinding it. Like every time, I, every time we say this, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's another theme. Oh, there's good. Another yeah. Lesson. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. that, the, you know, because yeah. I, I part of me was like, I know you probably told the story no, so I many know. times, but and we really, we really, we really haven't unpacked it to this, you know, to this degree. So I appreciate again, the, the, the space. And so you guys, you have the podcast, um, you have the, I've got it right here. <laughs> Mushy love, uh, cinnamon swirl latte. Is this the only yeah. flavor you have right now? Yeah. 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 So, um, I don't currently, for people listening, I don't currently have a kettle here, so I wasn't able to have the hot version, but I put some in with some water and ice and it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Good, I mean, I'm it's no I joke. Because it. yeah. that's super basic. You know, we, we encourage people to, to use their favorite milk and blend it in, either have it steamed or, or uh, with cold milk. Um, so you had like the most basic version possible. So that's great. I'm just a basic it. bitch anyway. So <laughs> it's just, it's on brand. So talk like, like talk, Talk to the, everyone here about what, why is this, you know, as again, the hydration piece is so interesting to me. I'd yeah. never thought about that. So yeah. yeah. Well, first it's a representation of this complete roller coaster love journey and, and mushrooms have been this theme, this little mascot of, of the story. And so it's just been our passion to um, have something that is, that is ours together, that is representative of, of that. Um, so that's kind of the intention. First of all, is like, Hey, this mushroom space is completely like all over the place, there's products that are either quality, but not very many mushrooms or they're a ton of mushrooms, but they're, they're not great quality. There's a lot of nuances in, in the mushroom adaptogen space altogether. How do we gift something to people who are looking for adaptogenic healing, um, are looking to give themselves love in a, in a way that can come in as superfood? And uh, how can we give them a ton? Like yeah. we're, we're trying to give people a ton of mushrooms. That was, that, yeah, that was... <laughs> We need, we need that on the t-shirt. We We're trying to give people a ton of mushrooms. That was the first question that we wanted to answer was like, how do we put the most possible mushrooms in here and still have it taste good? Because mm. anyone who's worked with mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms as an ingredient knows that it's tricky because they're really earthy. They're bitter. Some of them taste like fish. Like it's not the easiest ingredient I to work with. I have some tinctures. I forget who it's from. It's the the company that Jake Plummer's involved with. Mm. Mm. I don't I don't know that one. We're out of Colorado. Yeah, oh, I, know, okay. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, there's about. there's quite a few of them. And it's like 
I, I trust the quality of it, but to choke it down. Is yeah. Like, ugh. Yeah. 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 So we wanted to make it, you know, a really enjoyable experience for people. Something that people are excited to interact with. Yeah. And we we wanted to use um, chaga as a, a base mushroom because it does have an earthy kind of coffee-ish taste, latte-ish taste. And then the other one was a no-brainer. It was tremella mushroom, which is the beauty mushroom. Um, if you look at this thing in nature, it looks like a mix between a jellyfish and a snowball. Like it's freaking beautiful. And I don't know why the, you know, as the medicinal mushroom space has blown up, I don't know why there's not more talk about tremella because there's a lot of talk around anti-aging, biohacking, you know, injecting this, doing that, make sure you don't have any wrinkles here or there. Well, you know, there's only so much you can do to the exterior when really like aging gracefully, you know, it really starts with what are we feeding ourselves? What kind of nutrients and building blocks are we gifting to our body to create our skin? And how do we start glowing from the inside out as corny as that sounds? And Tremella was just, there's, she is unmatched when it comes to skin hydration and hydrated skin is healthy skin. They are not they're not mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand. And so Tremella mushroom, such a badass. She's been used for thousands of years, dating back to, I think, the, the eighth century, like ancient Chinese, ancient Chinese dynasties. And uh, so she holds 500 times her weight in water. And she also helps the body produce this enzyme that's called superoxide dismutase which is very, very powerful for fighting free radicals. Free radicals are, I'm sure your listeners are well aware, our listeners are as well. That's really what causes this oxidis, oxidation, this premature aging in the body when we're exposed to these free radicals and our body can't doesn't have the tools to deal with them the way that it should. And so tremella is one of those uh, medicinal mushrooms. That, and it's also great for... Um, you know, things like lung health and fighting infections, but really her, uh, her claim to fame is the skin hydration beauty element that is really unmatched by any other, um, any other mushroom. It, it, again, like the mushroom space, that's daunting to step into for yeah. crying out loud. And it so is. to really differentiate yourself, I think you've done an amazing job because nice. a, it tastes amazing you stand by the quality of the product. You're introducing, is it Tremella? Yeah, Tremella. Tremella. Yeah. I'd never heard of it before y- y'all mentioning it. So you're introducing this new mushroom that has incredible benefits to it. I mean, it, it's it's fascinating. But like as you were stepping in, like what were some of the other iterations you came up with before you landed on this? Yeah. Or were know, there many? Or was this like this is this is no, what this, we, this was a this was a definitely <laughs> labor of love. Um yeah. there's a few things that are in in I've worked in the nutraceutical space for a while. Um, and so get a little peek behind the scene uh, on how nice. you, how little tricks and, and things of that nature. And, you know, one of them would be to include um, alternative sweeteners that yeah. aren't necessarily like sugar, but they do, uh, they are quote unquote natural. Um, stevia and monk fruit, most people are familiar with, although we are, we are supporters of both of them. There, there's enough data around gut disruption, endocrine disruption on both of those in high consumption that we're like, Hey, let's, let's, see if we can avoid this mm-hmm. uh, second to that would be natural flavoring organic natural flavoring yeah it is a trick in the nutraceutical space and the supplement space that you can put pretty much anything you know you can heat uh pig skin to a crazy high degree and it can end up tasting like watermelon i mean I'm, this is just a, a i have a pet pig so careful <laughs> no but i hear you but like this this, this it's is the, shit like that where people what, don't yeah don't understand so key to this was how do we make this thing taste delicious without stevia monk fruit and natural flavors Um, we stumbled across organic maple sugar which is getting used a a little bit more in the space but it is it's like one sixteenth um the sugar of like table sugar but it's as sweet if not more plus it's loaded with antioxidants so maple sugar is a critical piece um we've always like it's got like a graham crackery taste to it if if you noticed and um, we've always been fans of like golden graham yeah. cereal. 
<laughs> Cinnamon and, Toast Crunch. Duh. And so it's like, all right, how do we how do we avoid making a mocha? There's lots of chocolate out there. How do we avoid oh. making something that tastes, you know, there's some brands that have leaned into just the fact that mushrooms taste like dirt or taste yeah. like mud. Um, so how do we find this like graceful, happy medium? Um, Lakuma is another one. It's a, it's a, I think it's in like a, the fruit family technically, but it's got a, a nice caramely um, and, 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 and thick texture. It's got a really good uh, probiotic or prebiotic fiber that helps with digestion as well. So that ended up having a nice caramely flavor that we added to it. Um, but there was lots of iterations, lots that tasted yeah. really bad. We were buying, you know, bulk ingredients on Amazon and mixing it up in our kitchen and, you know, trying it with milk, with water, with this, with coffee. And we're like, uh, it's okay. And there, that probably went on, you know, this took us a, probably a year and a half to formulate, to get to a formulation where we were like, okay. And you wanted to be able one. to hit these different yes. things. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Quality ingredients and a taste experience that people are excited about. And, uh, and so we, we were like, okay, this tastes good to us. Let's see if we can, you know, create a, a, a product out of this. And then, um, Chase's, you know, hookups with the manufacturers and all of that, like very grateful for, for his experience there, but it was definitely a labor of love. We probably went through 10 different iterations of this formulation until we landed on this one. Yeah. And we definitely had another key pillar to, you know, what we wanted to create was something that like was affordable. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what does so, this retail for? So it's, if you want to subscribe, it's 38 bucks and it's 48 bucks, uh, as a one-time order. Um, be happy to hand out your audience, a, a coupon code as well. Awesome. Um, Could you make it unlearn? Yes. Yeah. Nice. Unlearn gives you 10% off. And then, um, so if, if you break it down in the servings, you know, depending on, on if you subscribe, it's like a buck and a half, uh, mm -hmm. to a buck 75 per latte. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. I know that, uh, my wife really likes strong coffees, like packets Yeah, and, and that I think you're almost three bucks a serving. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So yeah, it's, it's this representation of, you know, our story as well as our passion. And, and, uh, it's been really, really fun. Yeah. We like to say this is a, we wanted to create a product that was reflective of two of our biggest passions, high, highest quality mushrooms and highest quality love. So mm. this is mushy love. The packaging's amazing. So who came <laughs> up with that? Was that an outside, like a friend or something? Or That was a, a team effort for sure. We worked with a graphic designer and uh, the Mushroom of Life logo on top is our, actually our podcast logo. Oh, so I that's, just saw y'all in yeah. there. Yeah, that's, that's us. So cool. Yeah. So, Kevin would be really impressed. <laughs> this is our guy. Um, yeah, so we knew we wanted to, to use that logo and, and then, I, you know, depict the mycelial network on the package and just have a really kind of uh, soothing, high quality, classic look to it. So, yeah, we did work with a designer, but we were very much like involved in the process. Like, nope, we want this, not that. OK, try this, try that. Yeah, it's really I mean, the packaging. I love good branding. This is you nailed it. I love the colors. I you. love there's just enough information on the front. You got a cool, your story on the back. The, I mean, it's, I love it. Wow. Thank, thank you. you. High yeah. praise. Yeah, no, this is, this is great. So you've got that. Yeah. How long ago did you launch? Uh, just August. Yeah. yeah. Just launched in August. Oh yeah. shit. Yeah. yeah. What been, are you doing to like, how are you getting the word out besides obviously your podcast and all organic. this podcast? Uh, we've, yeah. uh, the intention was to, to get through at least the first couple POs with, um, organic reach so that we can not, uh, prop this thing up through digital and social uh, media spend. And so, so far so good. Uh, our podcast, uh, we've got a handful of, of friends in the space who are slinging it on their podcast or their YouTube shows and um, word of mouth, man. I think we, we live in such a volatile um, marketplace and um, I think, and I've seen it as I've worked with brands, uh, e-com brands specifically ride just complete roller coasters. And uh, the proof of sustainability is how it moves through word of mouth and how it moves through organic. Mm -hmm. So believe it or not, 2022, the most tried and true predictor for how, uh, you know, well your, your product is going to do is still the words that are coming out of people's mouths yeah, and whether they are it. willing to share. And so we really wanted to prove that um, even if it meant like smaller POs and like a slower launch, um, for the sake of having confidence in its sustainability. 
Yeah, you don't want to, right, have this thing start to blow up and then no one's reordering and now right. you're just left with all this inventory and it's like, oh, this, we actually didn't get this right. Yeah, yep, we didn't exactly. want to pay for our customers through, you know, digital ads right off the bat. Like yeah. if that, you know, makes sense down the road, once we prove the concept, great, cool, we can step into that. But we wanted to hear from people's mouths like, holy crap, I'm out of my bag. When is my next order? Can it come sooner kind of feedback. And then do you have any more SKUs that you're lining up were you sticking uh, with this for a bit? We've definitely entertained the idea of having a mocha um, mm -hmm. with a couple of other of our favorite mushrooms. And that's the great thing about mushrooms is you could probably create a dozen different products based on uh, the various adaptogenic properties that, that each one of them have. Um, so we've definitely talked about a mocha. Uh, we're sticking with our latte right now. We do have a, um, and this is what, what the primary function of our business has been for a couple of years. It's an immune supplement called AHCC. It's a derivative off of shiitake mushroom. That is, uh, it, it's actually pure mycelium from shiitake mushroom, different from what you'll find with myceliated mushroom products that are out in the marketplace right now. Most of them are the growing medium, which is yeah. grains and, and um, filler. filler and barley that, that the mycelium is grown off of. Well, they take the entire uh, growing medium and they turn it into a powder and, and they'll put it in a capsule or into a tea and they'll sell it to you. Um, AHCC is actually a really long uh, production process for extracting pure mycelium. And in that mycelium, and Megan can speak to this significantly better than I can, is a uh, significantly more profound immune impact uh, upon supplementation. Yeah, yeah I was going to say this is, you guys uh, mentioned this a lot on the website. And so yeah. I was really curious about, yeah. it sounds like you had quite an experience with it. Maybe? Yeah, yeah. So I, um, I learned about this actually when I was a dental hygienist. I, uh, from one of our patients at the office, she was diagnosed with HPV later in life, like around 50 and her naturopath recommended this mushroom. That's what she called it. Um, to help her clear this HPV and it worked. So I piqued my interest and I was like, what is this AHCC stuff? I've never, this isn't a mushroom. Like, what is this? So I get on Dr. Google and I quickly mm -hmm. find like, holy crap, there's a lot of anecdotal stories about this. Holy crap, there's a whole research organization associated with this. And so I just started this, this snowball. And this was back in 2017, 2018. And I just couldn't stop learning about it. There was something in me that was like, you need to know about this. Like, keep learning, keep going. And so I did. And uh, I started telling patients about it. And then I started, um, Chase mentioned earlier, I started sharing on Instagram about AHCC and it's, it's a amazing benefits. I actually created a food and started selling that online. Um, and, uh, and then I was, um, I wanted to go to, uh, actually at the health conference that we reunited at, I was there for AHCC. I was meeting the manufacturers from Japan. So this immune supplement has been, you know, used for 30 plus years. It was developed in the late eighties in Japan. And it is currently the most clinically researched immune supplement in the world, yet hardly anyone has heard about it, but it's used mostly in research organizations and teaching hospitals and, uh, you know, has 30 plus in vivo clinical trials behind it. Things for like liver disease, cancer, HPV, epilepsy, autoimmune, like tons of different things, yet hardly anyone has heard about it. And, Again, first yeah. time I had heard about it was preparing for the show. Well, and it, uh, I got to give this girl a ton of credit. She, she started her life over for AHCC. She left dental hygiene. She travels to Japan and meets every single Japanese, you know, scientist in the manufacturing process. She's this beautiful, you know, American girl showing up to Japan, like, I'm like, like hugging them, taking notes <laughs> and asking about every step like, of the process. Oh. Um, and she actually convinces them to, to give her a private label off, off of this, uh, uh, AHCC. Well, the reason nobody knows about it, despite its, you know, incredible uh, benefits is it is expensive AF to manufacture. Yeah. It, it takes, you know, to extract. It did look, I mean, what is it for? Was it 60 capsules? Yeah. It's it retails at 90. 90 bucks. But the process, and we've done this to, to really intentionally make this affordable, oh. but it's to extract, think about the roots of a root structure of mushrooms. Yeah, it's a These very, little very delicate. So to get that pure, uh, mycelium it's a long extraction process it's cultured over 60 days in these liquid tanks and then it's dehydrated and encapsulated so it is a very <laughs> robust manufacturing process that 
no, that is one of a kind, no other mushroom supplement goes through this process. Uh, so that, that's why it's, oh. it's so, so it's, unique. it's that you're just making it affordable. It's, it's a, like if we were really going on what right. margins normally like, are, it'd be way it, more it expensive. It would be probably Honestly, yeah. closer to $150 and if we were really, you know, shooting let's, for that. Let's be real. Active hexose correlated compound <laughs> is the least sexy name ever. Yeah. Um, and so I, and I'm convinced of this is that we don't even know 1% of what the, the mother Gaia can gift for uh, healing in the form of these superfoods that we've called them or adaptogens. We don't know 1% because it's probably either too expensive to manufacture and get on a shelf and make a profitable margin, or it is so ridiculously named that there isn't a proper marketing angle. I'm convinced hmm. that we are, you know, there's a treasure hunt out there to come up with these things that can heal so many issues in our world. Um, but that it's the capitalist model, which, which I've, you know, has supported my life in, in many ways, but it, it is the incentive for, uh, you know, profit that can and marketing that can keep some of these things from showing up. Mm, so cool. I'm excited to try that too. Yeah, Damn. We'll, we'll yeah. send you some. Now I, I love, uh, I love your website. Um, one of the things I've wanted to do with my website, I haven't quite got around to it, but it's it's what you guys call the medicine cabinet. Mm. Because mm -hmm. people are always curious, yeah. what are you using for these different things? You guys have done an amazing job. I love that. Um, what are some of your favorite things in your medicine cabinet? What are you thinking of? Oh man, I don't even know where to begin. Um, top the, three. Top three. You can't use AHCC. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's Honestly, in there for sure. I, I'm going to say feel free. It's here. Uh, we're, we've had it today. How um, did you uh, discover? Was that through Paul check? It was through Paul. Yep. Uh, we were, we were doing some art therapy with Paul and he was like, yeah, you should give this a try. And I'd, I'd never had Kratom. I'd heard of it in like truck stops. You know, there's like <laughs> yeah, goofy dude. like trucker pills for Kratom. I'm like, I don't know, man, I'm not sure about this. Uh, but I was so blissed tuned in. One of the things I love so much about Kratom and I, and I, I get the raw leaf now as well. Um, but what I love about it is it tunes you in and it blisses you. So you're tuned in instead of tuned out. You're blissed. You're not buzzed. And I love both of those attributes. So, so feel free has been big. It's a great pre podcast or uh, pre creative uh, flow. And, and really it's, so it's a, it's, it's Kava and Kratom and the Kava is it's 10 parts Kava to one part yeah. Kratom. So it's definitely a more Kava centric Right. tonic but um those two seem to pair well together they really do yeah. yeah um i would say uh i'm gonna jump in here yeah, and i would say it. um uh the the coffee that we drink is a, it's yeah. a reishi spore coffee it's called king coffee and there's also another version that's called black coffee that's from the fruiting body um but i switched from regular coffee four years ago to this and the benefits are just crazy. So, uh, the spores is, are considered to be more potent than the fruiting body, but they have to go through this really delicate process of uncracking the endospore, which is like, there's two outer shells to the, the spore. So if you're just using a product that has uh, medicinal mushroom spores in it, and they haven't gone through that very delicate process of cracking that, then you're not reaping the benefits. So this this company has done that. They have a patented process to crack that endospore. So we uh, drink this King coffee. It's a mixture of organic coffee with the reishi spores. We mix that with mushy love in the morning and it's delicious. Um, King coffee uh, reishi is the Beyonce of mushrooms. I'm sure everyone mm. on this podcast has, mm. has heard of reishi, um, but it's literally supporting every system in the body from head to toe. And uh, it's also like anti-parasitic, um, it's antifungal, antiviral, supporting the endocrine system, uh, you know, um, the circulatory system. So there's unending benefits with, with that. So if anyone's like, oh, I gave up coffee because of my health or because of caffeine or whatever, it's probably not the coffee beans in and of himself. It's probably the mycotoxins or the, uh, you know, chemicals, pesticides, glyphosate that are sprayed on the coffee beans that you're reacting to, not the actual caffeine or coffee itself. So you can switch to something like King coffee, which is a really great alternative. And, and, um, yeah, you might even, uh, release some parasites. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. I like the sounds of yeah. that. Yeah. I would say rounding out third, um, can't not 
uh, Organifi, and um, it's the best green juice on the planet. It's just just flat out when it comes to instant green juice powders. Um, I've obviously am biased because um, I've been uh, just just fortunate enough to be a beautiful part of this wild roller coaster journey that has been Organifi Superfoods in San Diego. And um, I have the green juice every single day. It's got a clinical dose of ashwagandha, which was profound for my uh, adrenal uh, recovery. Uh, ashwagandha is an adaptogen that is very supportive of regulating cortisol. And for me, my cortisol, which is my stress hormone, uh, was cranked at uh, to every degree possible uh, during my uh, financial consulting career and my exercise habits stacked on top of that, the stress of my divorce on top of that. I actually got to the point where, you know, I stopped producing enough cortisol because it had, it had um, just been maxed out to such a degree. And so very supportive of managing um, stress. Also, uh, the byproduct of that is is uh, supportive of testosterone. Um, sex hormones can't essentially be expressed during um, stress hormone release like cortisol. You're either and, making stress hormones or sex yeah, hormones, so, not both. So that's a that's Good a know. really great way. And if you don't want to just take a tincture, you can have it taste like a delicious uh, mint green drink and or uh, we have a, a green apple as well at Organifi that that uh, is made from Washington state apples. It's not you know, artificially sweetened. And um, we've got a bunch of other products at Organifi too, but that is a daily practice for me is to have a big old ice cold green juice. I love it. And did, I, are you good with number three or yeah, do yeah, you yeah, can yeah. add a no, you can add a number four just cause. I would say, uh, this is more of a recent find. Uh, I, I can't believe that I'm 33 and have been, you know, obsessed with holistic health as long as I have. And I haven't heard of this, but, um, have you heard of ASEA? A-S-E-A? A-S-E-A. No. Asia. So freaking amazing. It's, so it comes in two different forms. There's a liquid and a gel. And uh, it's basically a cellular regeneration and communication supplement. So it's full of what's called these redox molecules. Redox molecules are the communication centers of our cells. So we drink the liquid every day and then we use the gel like I use the gel on my face twice a day to help cellular regeneration and communication. So it's literally just at the source helping your cells communicate and function better. So what that looks like is, you know, a lot of people use it to support daily health. A lot of people use it uh, to to um, break out of their chronic illness. I'm not going to use the word heal, but it does support the body that way. Um, and then it also is helping, you know, um, the way that our bodies break down over time, the way that they age is at a cellular level. Like it doesn't just Hap, you know, cancer doesn't just happen. It starts with a rogue cell that goes crazy. So how do we make the cells work better at a fundamental level? Well, they need to communicate better. So that can also um, equate to, it can also manifest in the body as like a quickened or accelerated healing. So like if I have a cut, a scrape, anything, I'm rubbing a SIA gel on it because it's helping those cells communicate better, faster, and uh, ultimately function better. So that's been a huge find for us. Um, yeah, absolutely. This is the duct it. tape. Of <laughs> yeah, supplements. It, is. it really is. Seriously. And, uh, you know, bonus tip for everybody out oh, there, yeah. <laughs> apply to the nether regions. Yeah. Um, just saying it amplifies the, um, yeah. the sexy time. Yeah. yeah. So it is, it's, um, increases blood flow. So I, they say to, um, this is not my recommendation. It was a recommendation that was given to me, apply three times in five minutes, you know, before you know that you're going to you know, dip into sexy time. And I will just say, holy crap, it works. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, some might even say like, Oh, that's a little too sensitive. So it increases <laughs> blood flow and sensitivity, both male, female. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Eventually it would make its way to the other. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> that's great. How did you guys, uh, hear about it in the first place? Um, actually I had an eye, uh, sort of infection slash just bout of inflammation. I went to the eye doctor. She gave me eye drops. I was like, mm, fuck that. And so I went out to my community and was like, Hey, do you guys know of any holistic eye health things that I could look into? And a lot of people recommended a SIA and I was like, what is this stuff? How have I not heard of it? And so I looked into it and was just blown away. Um, and uh, talked to one of my friends who was a big influencer and uses it, has used it for five years. And her husband got shards of fiberglass in his eye. So he did an ASEA eye wash and it's 
totally healed, totally fine, and now sees better than the eye that was undamaged because he was <laughs> bathing it in a sea. And so I was like totally convinced and used that, totally cleared up my inflammation. And then from there, I was like, what is this stuff? I have to know about it. So that's how we got started. And those are just the top four. I mean, yeah. those are <laughs> high. End. I mean, yeah. it's a it's a passion to play with supplements and devices and and uh, all this good stuff that um, that's the medicine. That's a yeah. part, the name of our show is the medicine, and and we specifically left the e off the end of medicine because we're not trying to slip into the groomed run of what we should uh, be using as medicine in our life, and rather we get to find what is medicine yeah. for us and. Um, that's what the medicine cabinet and the medicine's all about. I love it. It's like medicine unlearned. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which I, we've totally. I know we've completely this hijacked. Is like, no. How are we doing on, how are we doing on time? We're great. We, we get, yeah, we got about 15, 20 minutes. Okay. I, yeah, I we love, definitely want to bounce the ball back to you. And we definitely want to get, we're gonna have to get you back on. Um, and we'd love to have your, your you know lovely wife on yes. as well. And we can get even further into this, but um, the synchronicities with, with this unlearning idea, with this redefining yeah. um, idea I would love to hear what it's been like for you from a, from a relationship perspective, a romantic relationship perspective um, with your wife. Um, what, what has your perspective been as you've gotten older and as your relationship has evolved, what have you had to unlearn or reevaluate as it pertains to romantic relationships? Yeah. Great question. I, I would say just to give a, a little context for timeline my unlearning kind of kicked off in the fall of 2017. And um, within that, it, it did happen to involve, well, just I'll keep this one brief. I was in Las Vegas 2017 for the mass shooting. Mm -hmm. I was at the concert um, unharmed. And um, that just stirred something in me that, uh, something's not right with my life because it was almost kind of over. And I had a, just a lot of like regret and a, a lack of fulfillment for a life that on the outside looked amazing, but there was something wasn't right. And, uh, about three weeks after that, I had my first psilocybin journey and that, as you can imagine, cracked me wide oh, open yeah. and I started to see things kind of almost more objectively and, uh, you know, felt like I had seen where I had come up short with, with my relationship with my wife, with my kids and, and just in general, it wasn't, you know, e e often you make the mistake, or at least I made the mistake of thinking, oh, I'm good now. I've seen it. Yeah. So the integration part was yeah. really challenging and um, I would say by about a year later, um, I had gotten to a point where Peyton and I were down in Mexico at a wedding at this beautiful resort that had cenotes and had a deep Mayan culture um, kind of infused throughout it. And, and we ended up having another ceremony. And so we kind of laid to rest the previous marriage um, and started fresh, kind of accepted each other for all our faults and all the things that we had quote unquote done wrong and we're moving forward. And so, you know, so it's now, it's been four years and it's just, it's understanding that there's work to be done. And I don't even like the word of work. But um, just because you're not fighting and arguing doesn't mean there aren't th that things yeah. are okay. Yeah. And just, you know, for me, you know, when things are out of balance with Peyton and I, generally it's because I'm receiving what she's sharing as an old wound, mm -hmm. you know, in particular. <laughs> Might as well say it. You know, my dad was really, you know, was tough. And uh, as much as I got things right as a kid and did really well, he held me to a pretty high standard. And a lot of times when Peyton has something for me, it's my dad mm. coming 
to me yeah. and I like shut down yeah, and avoid. That. And, you know, it's only through working with an amazing therapist that I've started to recognize this. And so I can start to work with that. And um, it's just shit like I would have never thought. Yeah. It's like, but for me, just to being open to reaching out to different coaches, therapists, whomever to work on this stuff and not get caught up in doing, always doing the work either. It's like, yeah, do some work, play, use the tools and then, and then see what comes up. And, uh, you know, our friend Jared Picard had introduced me to, um, a woman, Dr. Teshna, and I forget her last name, but she's all about, I forget what system she uses, but it, she's fascinating. And it's like, whenever you are feeling stress, she'll walk you through it. You do these different kind of techniques to calm the vagus nerve and kind of rewrite the story of the stress and get mm -hmm. to the source of it and see it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So bringing in Dr. Teshna sometimes when I'm yeah. feeling overwhelmed and it's just knowing that I have the resources available. Be discerning when I use it. And like I said, it, we can get caught up, you know, myself. And I've seen a lot of people in the community just always doing the work. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you just got to stop doing the work and you've got you've to live and, and try to integrate. And yeah. so this is like some of the, the things that uh, I would have never guessed that Peyton was showing up as my dad. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I, totally, I totally see that. I haven't seen from that perspective. but. You know, as uh, we both had pretty, pretty strict, hard nosed fathers, and I can see how your person, even though they love you more than anyone in this world, and they're the the feedback that they're offering you is coming probably from a really loving place. Yes, how we twist it in the mind and turn it into something where it's like, oh, I must not be good enough, or I'm unworthy, or you know, I don't deserve this, or whatever, and it's like I'm just not doing enough you know, doing your being. And, and, um, oftentimes I think, especially from the feminine, it's, it's not that she, she's probably not asking you to do more. She's probably even asking you, I would guess to like do less and just be with me. You might be right. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a common theme and, and, yeah. and you're right. It, it's, um, for me, it's like, the, the the thought that comes to mind is oh I'm in trouble like think about it. oh, it's like yeah, a fucking yeah. seven year old yeah. you know phrase I'm in trouble like what would I do I fucked up and it 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 only feels that way because that's how I call it in yeah you know and it's totally like that. objectively that's not what she's saying but that's yeah the triggering mm -hmm. so oh man I, I I totally get it I the question that echoes in my mind and it's parenting, but it's coaching and it's teachers. It's who am I if I don't produce for you, if I don't create something for you, a product for you. Um, and that's athlete culture. That's uh, even Christian culture to a certain degree. And um, it shows up in our relationship. Even if yeah. it's, even if Megan is simply asking a question, Hey, are we, what happened to the X, Y, Z? Like even this week, you know, I, I have scheduled a, a lot of the uh, planning and flights and times and hotels and meetups and hey where is this and if it's not there i'm immediately scrambling to make sure that it doesn't appear like a failure ah. and it come and so i i respond to that with um it's not hostility but it's tension and intensity and she's like yo i'm just asking a question <laughs> and i'm like trying to defend the uh, product that i've produced and yeah. the way that we should execute our life and wow. um it's just wild how that shit surfaces and, yeah and it's like the same thing as like you know, my dad wondering why I'm not averaging 21 points per game instead of, you know, 19 points or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because that's a very similar, like my reaction to a, an inquiry. It has all that stuff wrapped up and she's like, why, you know, why are you so intense right now? It's like, yeah. fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I know. But <laughs> I'm not. What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. I was just yeah. answering. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think too, like to give, to defend both of you a little bit, like you guys, I can just, you both intense individuals and you take your work very seriously. And if someone, you know, the feminine is coming in and it's like, Hey, where's this? 
And it's like, I didn't have that ready. Like it's, you know, it's, it could be just because you were already intense in your work, what was right in front of you, something comes in and you haven't transitioned to like, oh, this is the love of my life. Who's simply asking a question. I can respond in love and, and softness, not intensity. That's not what she's looking for. Um, so Props to you for both recognizing that. Obviously, the integration yeah. is a little more complex, but <laughs> I'd be curious to hear from you. Um, you know, as your relationship stands now, compared to maybe what it was like earlier, uh, some things that you've that have come to you, both of your attention, and you've actively looked towards changing or transitioning. Like even on this vein in our relationship, in part two, what we call part two now, um, where I used to come off the airplane on a Friday night and come home, and I, granted, I'd have I'd have had the trifecta which was wine beer and a shot uh, on the plane ride back and I was I was just um, cold stone cold and I was a little bit hot-headed you know um, because I was just still in work mode just still in in just attack and um, what I do now is after an intense work day there's there's a protocol and we work at home you know we're, we're in a work from home culture and so it's like, okay, I need to walk. I need a 30 minute walk. I need to nasal breathe. I need to exhale by humming and, you know, stimulate, stimulate my vagal nerve and, and have this sort of like parasympathetic response. I'm going to uh, meditate on just how much I love this woman, um, how much she lights me up and is the fuel for so much of my, you know, uh, passion and livelihood. And so there is a, there is a, almost like a protocol to transition as just an example of how you know we're changing. What does that look like for, for you and Peyton? Have there been some very clear things that have surfaced and, and allowed you to turn a, a, you know, potential stumbling block into a, to a stepping stone. Yeah. There's one kind of simple thing is uh, Peyton loves when I make her coffee in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so just like starting off the day with that kind of act of love of making, even if I'm not going to have the coffee, like just making her coffee. And, and then like, I always wake up before her mm. and when I'm asleep and someone's getting up, like, I don't want them to wake me up. So when, when I get up, I kind of tiptoe out, brush my teeth, do my thing. And then I go out into, you know, outside the bedroom and do whatever I'm going to do. Um, Peyton has said a number of times, like, I'm actually awake. I'm, I'm just, I like to lay in bed and pray and, and do her thing. So you can give me a hug. <laughs> you know, you're not yeah. disturbing me. I'm already up. Yeah. And so that's one that I'm currently starting to integrate. Mm. And again, it's an old pattern that it's like, I don't want to wake anyone up probably because I woke my dad up once and he <laughs> motherfucked me. Yeah. But um, those are a few that the first two that probably come to mind, I would say we're being a lot more intentional about family dinner mm. and, and really honoring that. Um, and in, within that, sharing that. We both do the cooking. We both can plan it. Sometimes with that, it some things can get lost in the shuffle, but we're, we're kind of doing a good job of both checking in with that. Where I think before it was a little bit more on her side of the ledger to kind of mm -hmm. game plan for dinner. But frankly, she doesn't love cooking dinner and I prefer to cook it more than she does. And owning the calendar again allows me time to go to the store if we need to get some food and not rely on what we just have maybe in the fridge. And so that's, I'd say that's one that's been important, not only for our relationship, but for the family is to really start to bring that together again. I love, love that. that. That's a, you know, how you do the little things is how you do the big things. And, and we found that space of preparing meals to be yeah. this like really interesting little playground for um, getting familiar with what the masculine and feminine role in the relationship looks like and, and being able to, to, you know, be a little more fluid in the way that we can change, uh, roles and responsibilities. And Hey, what does it look like for me to, after being masculine all day long decision? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. To be a little more fluid and a little more into my intuition and, and what, what it, what it looks like to, create something in, in the form of, of a meal. I'm not like a yeah. freaking chef, by the way. <laughs> Neither I'm, am I. I'm like, I'm like eggs and eggs and burger. Let's go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but it is a fun, a yeah. fun dance. And, and I, I feel like that's going to be something that even further evolves with, yeah. with family and kids. I have uh, one more relationship question yeah. for you. What is a piece of premarital advice that you never got, but wish you would have that you can impart to of course, the listeners, but specifically, what would you want your children to know? 
don't wait for there to be problems to have someone support you in your relationship. Mm. Oh, yeah, so good. There's, it's just a, a lot of times um, partners have a hard time communicating for the same reasons they're just saying with my dad coming in and there's, there's this triggering. Someone that can, you know, in some ways almost um, translate what you're trying to say and, and, and really being not quite a mediator, but someone who can bring the both of you together so that your needs are met, they're expressed and able to be met. So that's one of, been one of my challenges is I've been so concerned with tending to others' needs and it's not like, uh, it doesn't quite sound right, but I, I, I don't even know what my needs are because I'm so caught up in making sure that I'm performing and making sure everything's taken care of that I don't really know what I need. And, and having someone who can hold space for you to start to uncover that and, and then share that with your partner. Yeah. Because your partner can't take care of your needs if you're not expressing them. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that's, I think it's really important. Find someone that you, you trust and, yeah, understands, you know. Yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a big one. It's a really good advice. It's like not waiting for there to be a diagnosis diagnosis of cancer to take care of yourself. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like flossing every day. It's moving your body. It's, you know, making it uh, just normal. It doesn't, I love that. You don't have to wait for there to be dis-ease and issues. And that's certainly, you know, a piece of advice that we're going to impart on our our future child for sure. Because we, we did, we, you know, we waited till there was like massive dis-ease and it was like, well, the only answer is, is to split. Yeah. And that's, that's not the, that's yeah. not necessarily the answer. Well, we can, probably wrap um would love to know from you where people can can find you best how people can connect and support you best obviously you've got uh, the great unlearn podcast but i know you do a ton and you've got a lot of projects and i uh, would love to hear a little bit more about that and where people can can find you yeah i would say yeah the the, the podcast is kind of where i'm sharing kind of most of of that kind of good stuff i'd say the great unlearn and um yeah, I mean, I have a book that I'm working on that probably won't be out until the beginning of next year, but yeah. that's been a really fun project. It's a bit of a memoir, but a lot of just like, as you can imagine, opportunities for unlearning and, and really kind of sharing my story as a trader and the lessons I learned on the trading floor, which you know have carried me forward and the things that were challenging there are still challenging outside of it. So it was kind of fun to to do that. And then on Instagram, I'm not super active there, but cal.callahan. But yeah, uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing outside of that is investments and stuff like Feel Free and other products. Um, and really, you kind of mentioned this earlier, you know, what's maybe different. I just invest in things that I love. I, yeah. I don't really, if, if, if it's not something that I would talk to you about, you know, if I didn't have any money invested in it, then I'm not going to invest. But if I can at least get over that hurdle like i'm excited about this product then i will do you know deeper due diligence and then provided i really connect with the founders and the team then that's another layer but really um investing in people and it's something you've heard you know probably your whole life but it wasn't until i really started to do that and i started to see returns that were you know, arguably better, but it became less about the returns and more about the journey. Like it's fun to be involved with people that, yeah. you know, you're compatible with in that way and that you respect. I, yeah, I'm still that. in that learning process. Um, and, and my relationship to money is, is changing surely, but, um, it is hard, especially when you're, when you're achievement and looking for validation from, you know, performance to, to wonder what do I really want to invest my time, energy, resources, money into because it's interesting to me and it's and I'm passionate about it because I'm so it's so gray and muddy for me because I tend to do something and end up being good enough such that I get the validation externally from it. And so now I'm flooded with a bunch of things that I've been validated on, yet I can't remember if I like them or not or <laughs> if I ever liked them to begin with. And I haven't even put my toe in the pond of things that are actually of interest to me. And so I'm inspired by that and that, and that you are able to say that that is fruitful and and rewarding um, because I tend to still look at the margins on things that I (laughs) put my time, energy, resources, and money into. 
And that's an important aspect to it too, right? It, it's I kind of go back to trying not to be like my dad. There were things that my dad was doing that were really good. And so what are the things, you know, that's a part of due diligence that needs to make sense. Yeah. But then, you know, as I've taken this new path, it, it's no longer outcome-based. It's not about what is this going to be a 2X, 5X, whatever. It's, do I believe in the product? Do the numbers make sense? And do I want to be on this journey with this team? Yeah. And if I can check those boxes, you know, I'm, I, I think I'm in. Yeah. 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 Right. Hell yeah, man. There's so much more meat on yeah. the bone. I feel like we got to like two questions with you, but it's great feedback because, you know, it just means that we, we need to have you back on and, and well, I threw a monkey yeah, ranching. Yeah. It was yeah. like, why don't we do like a joy <laughs> yeah, podcast? It. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. It, it happened exactly the way it, it needed to, but we would love to get you back on and, and, you know, dip our toes even deeper into the conversation around unlearning uh, money and money belief systems and everything like that. Like you have so much wisdom there that I, I know that um, we would love to dip into and our listeners could definitely benefit from for, for sure. Yeah, I'd love yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Man, this oh. has been such uh, a blessing. Thank you so much for having us and, and uh, engaging in this lengthy conversation. Yeah. I love it. Anytime. <laughs> this was great. Thanks yeah. for being here. Yeah. yeah. Pleasure. Thank you.